Hello, investors, and welcome to our session here today. My name is Ken Rose, and this is Think Scripting. So interesting time unfolding here in the market. Had nice, some nice little runs up here to the upside, but it looks like we're pausing here. We saw a pause yesterday and possibly a pause continuing today. You know, in these types of environments where we have these strong trends going on, it can be particularly beneficial if we have some automated tools via Think Scripting to help us to identify those stocks with strong trends. We will refocus our discussion in that particular area here today. But before we get too far along, well, let's go ahead and run through some disclosures. And we have disclosures, investors. Do keep in mind that the information here is for general informational purposes only and should not be considered an individualized recommendation or endorsement of any particular strategy, chart pattern, or investment strategy. The paper money application we use here is for educational purposes only. For the sake of simplicity, the examples do not take into consideration commissions and other transaction fees. Always remember that backtesting results presented are hypothetical. There is no guarantee that the same strategy implemented today would produce similar results. And as always, investing does involve risk, including the loss of principles and past performance of securities and strategies does not guarantee future results. Well, typically investors in here, what we do, is we take steps in relationship to this. We identify a goal. We ask ourselves, can ThingScripting meet that goal? We outline the steps to script. We apply the ThingScript tools. We write custom scripts when needed. We test what is written related to the goal, and we share the links related to those scripts. Well, today we're basically in this area right here of testing what has been written and modifying what has been written and improving what has been written and sharing the links in relationship to that. That'll be our focus here today, particularly as it relates to trends and scripts related to trends. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pull up the Thinkorswim platform right here, and we should have that up here momentarily. And while that's coming up, just want to come over here and welcome everybody here today. So welcome to Kevin and Mike and Austin and Tom and Dave and Anthony and truth will always prevail. And everybody else looks like we have Ben Watson over there in the chat window. Great to have Ben here with us today. Very knowledgeable investor. Do feel free to send your questions over there to Ben. But also peek over there periodically to see if there's something that I can help out with as well. All right, investors, so some of you may remember um, a session we had, I think it's been one or two weeks ago, we talked about a trend indicator. And that trend indicator was something that was looking for stocks that had certain characteristics. And those characteristics included a, a faster term moving average moving above a slower term moving average, not, not only moving above it, but also the distance between the two moving averages widening out. And then in addition to that, not only looking at that from a bullish standpoint, but looking at that from a bearish standpoint, we did receive a nice little update in relationship to that that provided us some additional information in the labels. Those labels were colorized, help us to know if we were looking at a bullish situation or a bearish situation. And also, in addition to that, there were some numbers placed in those labels to help us to identify how many days the underlying security has actually been above the slower moving average. That would be, in our case, the 50 period moving average. So let's just take a, a look at an example here. And I'm looking over here at the chart we've got here. I have the S&P 500 brought up here. And right here, I have our initial version of this. I call it version one. It's actually probably version, version two or version three. I initially put this together and there were some nice improvements made to it by, by one of our folks out there. I think, I think this was Chess Dog. And then this week we have, an, we have an additional improvement to it, which is nice as well. But one of the, one of the aspects with regards to when you're, when, you're, when you're working with thing scripting that you want to keep in mind is sometimes you'll put something together and your code makes complete logic. In other words, you look at the code and there just isn't anything wrong with the code from a theoretical perspective. You know, you look at the code, you identify what the code is supposed to do, you put it in there, you check it. But for some reason, you're not getting the results that you're not getting the results that you expect. That just happens sometimes. And if we look at this, column one, column one, this is I'll call this our version one. Let's come down here to Tesla. We'll pull up Tesla here. By the way, before we do that, let's just take a quick peek here. What's going on with the markets here? So it looks like, um, how are we doing on the S&P 500? Yeah, you, you, you see up here, we had this nice strong run to the upside, then a couple of days pausing, and we got these little spinning tops. Of course, we still have about 50 minutes or so of trading remaining, so it'll be interesting to see what occurs during the duration of the day. Just looking at these quickly, it looks like uh, the NASDAQ's looking a little bit better. The Russell, on that Russell, we got that dark cloud cover going on, which does indicate a potential continued move it to the downside. Now, let's come back over here then and take a look at Tesla, okay? So... Here is our two moving averages. We have a, a slower moving average, which is the 50 period. This is going to be the black line right here. 
And we don't expect that to be as reactive to the price of the stock as the green line, which is a 20 period moving average. So the 20 is a faster period moving average and the black is a slower period moving average. And what this column is, is meant to find, it's meant to identify stocks where there are three characteristics. One is that the faster moving average is above the slower moving average if the box is green. But not only that, but also that the distance between the two moving averages is increasing. That's an indication of an increase in momentum with regards to the given direction. It doesn't mean the underlying security is just going to continue to go up and up and up, but it does indicate some, it does, it does indicate, it does indicate some strength with regards to momentum moving in that direction. So that's the, that's the first thing we're looking at. So if we have a green box over here, what that's indicating to us is that the faster moving average is above the slower moving average. The distance between the two is increasing. And then also, out of the last 30 days, current out if you if you go back and you go back in time, we're saying that over at least the last five days, the price is still above the slower moving average. In other words, the 50. So if I'm looking at Tesla right here, here's our 50 period moving average. We do have the crossover right here. And then if I'm going to come down here, I'm saying, okay, this day so far is above the 50. That's one. Two is above the 50. Three is above the 50. Four is above the 50 and five is above the 50. So, so far, so good. Now we had some additional information that was provided on our, on our label over here. And you can see right here, we have the green label indicating what we've just discussed. We also have 50, that represents the 50 period moving average and 23 right here, indicates that the underlying price has been over the 50 period moving average for 23 trading periods. Well, let's check that out. We come over here and, we, and, and we've identified, we got one, two, three, four, five, then I go six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, uh-oh, 14. We did not close above that slower period moving average. We closed below it. Right here, uh-oh, we closed below the moving average rather, rather than being above it. So this number right here of 23, that's not entirely accurate. So usually when we see that, of course, the first thing we'll do is say, okay, there must be something wrong with the code. Let's check out the code and see what's going on. Let's just take a look at the code here for just a second. I'm gonna come over here where we have the code right here. I'm gonna do a right click right here and choose edit formula. Now, now many of you were here in our last session where we discussed this, so you do have a link for this code. So you can bring it up as a custom column and you can open it up in the same way that I did so you can look at the underlying code in relationship to that. And the key statement here, and we talked about this in, in our previous session as well, the key statement here is the fold statement. The fold statement is looking to identify was the price above the slower period moving average over the last five days, okay? However, you can, also, you, can also, you can also construct the fold statement to go back and give you some additional information. So right here we have our fold statement. This is the bullish one, it looks like. It sure is. What we're saying here is we're going from 0, 30, so we're doing 30 iterations going back in time. And we're saying that while the closing price on each one of those iterations is above the 50 period moving average, we want to add that. Okay, so here we are right here. So we're, we're going from 0 to 30. We're going to go back 30. And each time the price is above the 50, we're, we're going to add that to an initial variable here, which we've identified here as T. Okay. Now, um, once it is no longer above that, then, that, the, then that's not going to come into play. Now, I looked at this and it looked to me to be accurate. There may be something that I'm missing here, but it looks to me that, that the structure of the code, it just looks correct to me. Okay. So if you do have a line of code and you're using a statement that doesn't appear to be providing you with the results that you anticipate, there's a couple of things you can do. One of which is to look to identify a different statement that basically basically does the same type of thing. Okay. And that's and that's and, and this is basically what uh, Mbox has done in providing us an update to this particular um, trend, to this particular custom trend column here. Now again, we did go through the fold statement in some detail over the last couple of sessions. We're not going to do that here today. It looks okay to me with regards to identifying the numbers over here in the brackets, okay, but apparently Something is not something is not correct, or the possibility is that the statement is not working correctly. And I have had that occur occasionally with regards to think scripting statements. Okay, so what do we do in relationship to that? Well, let me let's go and look at a at an alternate to the fold statement 
that was sent over to me again via via inbox. Again, thanks to inbox for sending this over. Let's I'm going to go ahead and cancel this. Okay, we'll come over here. So we're still using the colorized labels that Chestog that Chestog provided to us. We still have the 50 here, but now our numbers in parentheses are a little bit different here. You can see this here with regards to our update. Now we identified a little bit earlier that we're basically looking at about 14 days where we were staying above this, right? I, I may have miscounted by one, but 14 is definitely closer here than 23. So what statement did we what statement did we move to here in order to get to a more accurate rendition here? By the way, you'll also see that many of these are the same. So sometimes, it, so sometimes it could be related to the individual stock, like right here on ALK, we have nine here, we have nine here. So sometimes the individual stock, there just may be something unique about the stock that is, that is throwing things off just a little bit. But let, let's go ahead and open up this column right here. And we'll look at the code in here for just a moment. And one of the things you'll see that's different in here is the code has been changed. And rather than inbox, inbox has put a little pound sign here. It says, hey, you know what? We're going to put the fold statement here on hold for just a second. And we're going to use a different kind of statement. And we anticipate that possibly it will provide better results because it does the same type of thing. This, it does it in a different way. But, it, but when you're looking at a chart and you're, and you're going a long time, it, it tends to do the same type of thing. So the statement we're going to look at here then that we're replacing the fold statement with is a, it's called the compound value statement. Now, just a little bit of a heads up in relationship to this. I want to, I'm going to show you where you can get more information about the, com value, about the compound value statement, as well as other helps related to thing scripting. Just a reminder that when we're done with this, I'll share everybody the link. I always want to let everybody know that you don't need to get into the coding in our sessions here in order to get benefit from the sessions. In fact, when we start going over the coding, if you, if you decide to take a nap, I understand that. <laughs> Okay, because <laughs> not everybody gets into the whole coding thing, but I think I think everybody that attends these sessions do like to have the benefits of the custom links and the, and the like. Okay, so we will send out a link when we get done with our discussion here of the compound statement that all of you can use. All right, and by the way, those of you that are catching this as an archived recording, you know you won't have access to the chat window. If you look over at the if you look at the YouTube window and you go down to the bottom, you'll see a description there. And part of that description, I believe it'll be something you can click on there that says more. That opens up and gives you a more detailed description. When you go into the more detailed description, you'll see trend updated link. And that's where the updated link will be. Also, another heads up, if you, if you try the updated link today and it's not working for you, just simply wait till tomorrow. Okay. Some of these links, if they are generated relatively new, they may not work on the two versions of Thinkorswim that are currently out there until about 24 hours after they're done. And one of these was done a little bit earlier here today. So do be mindful of that. Okay. Also, while we're talking about the YouTube window, don't forget in the bottom right hand corner, there's a little button there that says subscribe. I strongly encourage you to subscribe to our sessions here today. That just helps to ensure that you're kept up to the latest and the greatest from the Trader Talks channel as well. All right, so here we are on our compound value statement. So I'm going to go through this. I'm going to go through this statement as we're using it here. But what if you wanted to get some additional details on using this statement? Where would we go? Well, an excellent place to go would be the Think Script Learning Center. And typically, when you when you bring up that Think Script Learning Center, you want to bring it up in a separate window. You can actually bring it up directly from the Thinkorswim website. The problem, the 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 problem that you have if you bring it up from the from the Thinkorswim platform is is what I'm actually saying. If you bring it up from the Thinkorswim platform, then you need to close it out when you're doing some other things on the platform. It's much better to bring it up in a separate. Um, web window, just so you can minimize and maximize, and you can go over to it any time that you want. So let's just take a look to see what that um, learning center looks like here. I'm going to pull that up here in just a moment. There we are right here. Notice, here's, here's the address for it. So it's toslc.thinkorswim.com forward slash center. I've sent this over in the chat window before. Let me just send it over there again. So you guys have this. If I can get over to the chat window, it looks like I'm getting there. And there it is. It's on its way. Okay. So now you have the link there and you, you can bring it up in a separate window. This is the learning center. 
you want to get into the ThinkScript stuff, I'm over here in the lower right hand corner where it says ThinkScript and go ahead and just click on this little icon right here. And this takes you to the main page of the ThinkScript um, center right here. Notice that you have a lot of nice stuff and you have a lot of nice information. If you're just getting started with ThinkScripting, I would, I would suggest you just come over here with this ThinkScript tutorial and just start going through these tutorials if you like. But if you see something, a statement or something else, you're, hey, you know, what is that? Well, just, just, you can just come up here in, the, in this box right here and just start typing it in. So we want to look at a compound statement, C-O-M-P-U-N-D. Here it is right here, compound value. We'll click on that. And this brings up the compound value statement. And this defines um, how to put this statement together. In other words, the information that's going to come to you. Now, um, admittedly, some of these descriptions, I think, are more beneficial than other ones. Frankly, I think the description with regards to the compound value statement is a little bit on the weak side. And I don't mean on the weak side because it is... It is um, Oh, super simple or anything like that. Actually, I mean just the difference. It it makes a jump to complexity. It it, it gives you an example in here that basically um, draws fib, draws the Fibonacci numbers, which is great. Okay, but if you look at the parameters that are put in here and you look at the description, it's just a little bit difficult to follow along. That's okay because we're going to look at look at our actual statement. But I did want to identify here for you. If you do want to come over here, you do have some nice text here that talks about it. Notice right here in the description, it calculates the combat compound value according to the following rule. It says, if the bar number is greater than length, okay, and the first thing you're going to put in here is the length, then the visible data, that's going to be the second information that's going to put in there. The visible data value is returned. Otherwise, the historical data value is returned. And we'll take a look at exactly what that means here coming up. This function is used to initialize studies with recursion. This is a key word right here, recursion, because the, one of the differences between a compound value statement and other statements that use recursion, basically when we're talking about recursion, we're just talking about a statement that uses previous values of itself. You know, for example, if you've got a, if you have a variable that, that and, and, the, and the name of that variable is, say, high spot, well, uh, you, you do define, then you get the name of the variable high spot, then you say equal, and in the calculation that follows, you can say, do this calculation, then take high spot one, which is the previous value of high spot, and add this particular value to it. So you, you can do the recursion like that without the compound value, but the nice thing about the compound value is you can initialize it to a specific value when it first gets going, and that tends to clear up some potential errors related to that. Okay, but just again, just keep in mind where we have the learning center and you can get some additional information. Let's shift gears here then and come over and take a look at our sample right here. It is right here. I'm going to grab a little drawing tool just so we can talk a little bit about this compound value statement as we're going along here. Let me just grab a, a little pointer here. To begin. So, first, so first of all, in the compound value statement, we're going to establish this... Um, there it is right there. That first number right there, that is the length, okay? And basically, basically what that means is that that's basically the bar number that the compound value statement is going to look at. So that's bar number one. That's the very first print on the chart, okay? So, so keep that in mind. And, 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 what it's going to, and, what, and what the compound value statement is going to look for, if, if the current bar number is greater than bar number one, which is going to be the first value on the chart, then it's going to run this calculation right here, okay? If it's not greater than the length that you have, then it's not going to run this calculation. It's not going to add anything here to this variable right here. But since we're using the first value on the chart, the first print on the chart, which is, which is usually what's used on this statement, it's just going to go along on the chart, and it's going to run this each time the entire length of the chart. So what's going to happen here then? Well, we're going to say, now some of you, some of you may be saying, wait a minute, Ken, we're over here in a column. We're not on a chart. Well, that's okay as well. The, uh, the columns over here have a default time frame that they look back on the charts. I'm not sure exactly what it is, okay? But it does go back far enough to run this calculation and do it with accuracy. By the way, if, you, if you're using the compound value statement and you see your numbers are kind of goofed up here and you realize it's not going back far enough, you may want to consider changing your aggregation period here to either week or month in order to accomplish that. Okay, but here is our value right here. Okay, and what, we're, what are we saying here? We're saying if the close, 
Now, keep in mind, we're in this situation, we're basically going along the chart. We're going here day by day by day by day by day along the chart, right? Each one of these is, is, lo is looking at an individual bar as we're going here day by day by day, all the way up to the end of the chart right here. We're looking at this, we're saying, if the close is greater than the, the SMA 50, that's basically the 50 period moving average, which is, which is identified earlier up here in a definition statement. If it's greater than the 50 period moving average, then see this guy here that's trigger three, then trigger three, and, and what we're saying here is use the previous value of trigger, trigger three, okay? So like, let's say, let's say on the chart, we're on this, we're on this value right here. We're, well, let's, let's say we're analyzing this bar right here. And right here, this is the previous value of trigger three, okay? Well, if this is true, if the close is greater than the SMA 50, then take this previous value of trigger three and add one to it. Okay, and then, and then we're gonna come up here, okay? Take that previous value and add one to it. Else, if it's not, return the value of zero right here, okay? So, we're, so the value that's gonna be returned either is gonna be the previous value of trigger three plus one or zero. So note, note that as, as we're going along the chart here, any time the price is below the 50 period moving average, this sets this value back here to zero, okay? So it sets it right back there over to zero. Now, what's the, what is the initial value that the compound value statement has? Well, notice that we have, right here, we have this little comma right here. The initial value we set it to is zero. So there's our initial value, there's our length, and this is the calculation that's run to, to identify how many days we've been above the we have been above the 50 period moving average and because this resets to zero it's just it's just it's just going to give us the actual days if you think about it when we're at when we're at the very end of the chart if we if we're currently above the 50 period moving average we're going to have a number there if we're not currently above the 50 period moving average then we're not going to have a number here okay so so we've used the compound value statement right here and we've used the compound value statement right here this is to identify uptrends related to the compound value statement. And this is to identify downtrends related to the compound value statement, okay? And with that, that's it, okay? All the other, uh, everything else here would be related to what was previously done on this particular statement. So let's go ahead and get our stuff off of here for just a second. And we've got that. I'm gonna come over here and click on cancel. And I want to share this link for, the, for those of you that are here live. Let me just pull up this link so I can send it to you over there in the chat window. I believe I've got it handy here. And I should have this. Oh, I'm just going to make a note here. KR. And then paste that over there to you guys. Okay. So you should have that over there in the chat window. Again, for those of you that are catching this as part of as part of an archived recording, just look in the YouTube, go into the detailed notes. Also, if, if you don't want to if you don't want to spend the time to copy that from the chat window, you can do this as well. Give the give the session about two to three hours to be posted with the updates, and about two to three hours after that one is posted with the updates, you can go in there, look for trend update, and it will be available to you over there as well. And again, a big thanks to Chess Dog for giving us the updates here with the colors and the numbers, and a big thanks to Mbox 50, Mbox 56 for helping us out here with regards to using an additional statement to help improve the accuracy. Again, I didn't see anything wrong with the, with the initial statement, but this additional statement, it looks like that's, that's just working out a little bit better here with regards to what we're looking at here, okay? All right, investor. So right here, I'm just gonna take a quick peek over there in the chat window, see if there may be a question that I can help out with where I have the advantage of the platform and Ben does not, okay? Well, let me just come over here and let's see, looks like we're in good shape. Thanks again to Ben for helping out over there as well. And one more check. It looks like everybody's doing great. Okay, fantastic. All right, investors. So I got a question um, last week and 
The question was this, and this, this kind of takes us back to the, to the historical dividend yield once again. <laughs> I know some of, some, of, some of you are saying, hey, Ken, we've, we've done the historical dividend yield, and I get that, okay, but I do get these questions, and if the question makes, if the question makes sense, I'm looking and I say, you know what, that actually would be beneficial, and I don't, I don't have any problem going back and saying, okay, is this something that can be done, and if it is something that can be done, would it be a good idea to do it? And let me show you what I'm thinking about, and I'll just, I'll just throw it out to you guys. I'll, we'll, we'll take a vote. Is this a good idea or is this not a good idea? Let's pull up Apple here as an example. And let me see what I've got here. I'm going to make an adjustment here on our historical dividend yield right here. Okay. There we have it right there. Now, we've had a discussion on the dividend yield. We're not going to go through the whole discussion again. But I would encourage you, if you, if you weren't able to attend our discussions on dividend yield, is go to the archives for Think Scripting and just look for a, for a session that's titled Buy Low, Sell High. Okay? And that'll basically take you through the understanding of why it would possibly make sense to use the historical dividend yield and how to use it. In here, you know, we like we like to do things from a practical standpoint. In other words, rather than rather than just write code to do something, we want to have a trading mentality around that, so that when I present something, we can see, you know, what that is actually something that could be beneficial to my investing. And I believe the historical dividend yield fits within that. But just to just just in way of review here, we're looking at Apple. You know, we've looked at Apple a lot. I'm going to actually shift gears here to go through something else. How about CVX? Yeah, let's look at CVX here. That's you know, some of the energy stocks have been in the news here a little bit. So we've talked in previous sessions. So here we have our, our dividend yield percentile. We've talked about that. We've talked about the low point, the high point, the current point, and how if, we, if, we're, if we're purchasing a stock when the dividend yield is relatively high, the price is relatively low. So that could be a situation where we could be buying low. And if, we're, and, and if the dividend yield starts to move down to some of these lower areas, that may be consideration for selling because that's a situation where it could be selling high. But again, we've talked about being careful not to get caught in a dividend trap and those types of things, okay? But we've also talked about looking on the chart here and running a calculation to determine with the current trailing 12 months dividends. In fact, let's bring a chart up here. I'm going to go back two years and let's go weekly here. Okay, if we're if we're looking at the chart here and we and we know what the current dividends are for the last four quarters, and it looks like on Chevron we have here, looks like Chevron has paid a dollar fifty one over the last four quarters. So we can take that number and we can calculate what the trailing twelve months of dividends are. In fact, let's grab a little calculator right here, and let's see here. Well. Let's start off from the beginning here. So we've got a dollar fifty-one, a dollar fifty-one. What is that? That's three o two times two, right? So if I take three o two times two, I've got. Oops, I asked. I accidentally divided that. Let's try that again. Okay, let's take three o two because that's dividends paid over half of a year, and we want to get the dividends for the trailing twelve months. I take 302 and times it by two to get the dividends that have been paid over the previous year right here, okay? So that's $6.04 of dividends that have been paid. Now, we know what the formula is with regards to calculating the dividend yield, and that formula is just in a, in a little bit of a review here. We, we take the trailing 12 months of dividends, which in this case is $6.04, and four cents divided by the current price of the underlying security equals what's called the trailing 12 months yield. Okay, and that's going to be a percentage. And I apologize about my, um, my free hand writing here, okay? So looking at that math, we can, we can say, you know what, there's another calculation here that may be helpful. And that is, at the current trailing 12 months of dividends, it's 604 right here, and looking at the high end of the yield and the low end of the yield, because we have the highest 
yield over here, and we have the lowest yield right here. At 604, what would be the highest price this stock would be trading at when the dividend yield is the highest? I'm going to come over here and say this is the dividend yield of the highest, and that highest dividend yield is 5.07. So we can calculate that number by taking 604 and dividing it by 507, okay? And that would give us, excuse me, that 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 would give us the that that would give us the lowest price. Okay, if we're taking if we're taking the trailing twelve months, we're dividing it by the highest yield. That would give us the lowest price that the stock would be trading at if the yields were at those high levels. In other words, if the yield was all the way up here, we had this as trailing twelve months. Where would the price be? Well, the, well, the price would be significantly lower than where than where it's currently at right here. The other the other math we could do is we could take the 604 and we can divide that by the lowest dividend yield. We divide that by the lowest dividend yield, that's gonna give us the highest price the underlying security would be given if we were looking at that particular dividend yield. So let me throw this out to all of you, okay? Would you find it beneficial if we had an additional label here? One label would say um, price when dividend yield is the highest and price when dividend yield is the lowest, you can kind of see where that price range would be if the dividend yield was different from what it currently is at. So let me throw that out to you. Helpful, not helpful, okay? I'm gonna give you a chance to vote on this, okay? Helpful to have that information as an additional label here or not so helpful to have that additional information in there, okay? Now, there's usually a little bit of a lag time between the time I solicit a response, and actually see a response. Let me just tell you what my thoughts were, okay? My thought was, you know what? I think most investors will probably find that to be helpful because you, we, you can calculate it manually, and we've talked about how to make those manual calculations, but it might be nice just to have a label down here that says, you know what? If the, if, if, if the current, if, if CBX was currently trading at its lowest dividend yield, this is how high the price would be. And if CBX was currently trading at its highest dividend yield, this is how low the price would be, okay? So I've got helpful, 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 that's great, okay? And I see one of, one of those helpful actually uh, came from the individual that uh, suggested this, and I thought it was a great suggestion, okay? So, look, so, so looking at this, so I went in there and I did a little bit of programming to provide this, and, I'll, and, and we'll go over and we'll take a look at the programming. I believe we're okay with time in relationship to that. And then, yep, we have another updated link here, okay? <laughs> So sometimes on this historical dividend yield, we wonder, are we ever going to get to the end of the updates? Well, we probably are to the end of the updates for a while, but, you know, somebody else sends me something. Hey, you know, Ken, I think this would be a nice addition. If it sounds good, I'm, I have no problem adding it. So let's let's shift gears here a little bit with regards to our study. I'm going to bring up the updated one. Then we'll take a quick peek into the code here. Go edit studies here. And this is our original one here. Let's take that off and then let's bring up the latest and possibly the greatest. I say possibly the greatest because just, just to remind investors that these are not guaranteed with regards to accuracy or time. And there may be something embedded in here that could be a problem. It's, it is brand new, I guess you could say, but I've got here vision 4.1. I've got here best to my knowledge. Just, let's just call that best to my knowledge, all right? And let's go ahead and click on apply here. And now you can see that we do indeed have Price at lowest yield. Okay, so if the if the if the yield was at the lowest point, the price on this stock would actually be at one hundred ninety three dollars. So, if the yields if the yield was at the lowest point, the, the this price the price this stock would be trading at about one ninety three. However, if the price was at the highest yield, then the price would be trading down here at about one nineteen oh eight. Okay. Now I know some of you are looking right now and saying, Hey, you know what? Couldn't we put that on the chart? That is a possibility, but I'm not sure um, how I'm, I'm not sure what the impact would be as far as using up resources. Perhaps that's something that I'll look at doing here. It would I would think though that it would need to be a study that you could choose to either have it showing or not showing. Um, it wouldn't be something that we could make part of our labels um, our, our labels uh, our labels study that we pull up here and we ha we have a lot of different fundamental information over here. It doesn't tend to blend well with with regards to with regards to the structure of that. However, it may be a possibility, but 
But I'll, uh, I'll put that on the, on, on the back burner for now as far as bringing up the lines here on the chart, but I thought it would be beneficial here. You know, a lot of times when we're looking at charts, particularly if you're a technician, sometimes you want to avoid getting too much stuff up here on your charts, particularly with, with regards to lines and the like. Sometimes it's nice to say, okay, 193.06, I can just bring my thing up here and say, so that's sitting right, right at about here to the high side. To the bottom side, 119, that's sitting about right here, so I can see it visually, okay? But that may be something to look at in the future. But that is that just to just to come in here and take a quick peek at the code, because this was not an extremely complex adjustment. But let's take a peek at the code here for just a minute to go over that adjustment. Over here, and I'm going to click on historical dividend yield, and I got the heads up. Okay, it looks like we've got a few more minutes here. I think we're going to be okay. All righty. So now, investors, we've gone through all this code, right? We're not going to do that here today. We just want to skip right to the stuff here, okay? And where have I got that here? I believe it is. Um, uh, let's see. Um, let me just see here. Here it is right here, plot highest and lowest. It's going to be this section right here. Okay. So notice that I'm... I've got the highest all dividend yield. We've talked about that in previous sessions. We're not going to discuss that here today. I've got the lowest all dividend yield. So this is going to be the highest and lowest dividend yield. Then I have here uh, define PDF. I got percentage here, plot highest and lowest percentage points. Um, where have I got that? I've got it nested in here somewhere. Yeah, I don't want to get in that stuff. Highest and lowest current percentage points. I all oh here it is right here. Plot 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 high yield line and plot low yield line. And then I pass that to a label. What have I got? Let's let's find our label here. Okay. That's gonna be the quickest way. Um, show labels to is dark mode. Light gray. This was not complicated. <laughs> I think I'm just having a little bit of hard time seeing this. Let's see. Where did that thing, where is that? It's not highest all, highest minus lowest all overbought. I'm sorry, I'm just kind of talking to myself to find this. Percentile show labels, add labels, show labels, yield, yield, no yield. Come on. I, don't, I mean, really, investors, all we need to do is find the text. You see this text right here? This is all I'm looking for is price at lowest yield. That should be in a label statement here. And that's just all I'm looking for is price in one of our label statements. So add label. Yield, no yield, yield, no yield, yield, no yield. Um, oh, here it is. Price at lowest yield and price at highest yield. Okay, so we found it. Good. Okay. All right, so here we have our, 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 our add label statement. We have these parameters in place just to determine whether or not we show the label we've talked about in, and we've talked about that in other sessions. This is just, does, does the stock pay dividends? If so, uh, do we have a yield related to that? If so, then we'll go ahead and put it. So here we have price at lowest yield. So how do we come up with price at lowest yield? Well, we took the trailing 12 months of dividends. Some of you will remember that when we calculated the trailing 12 months of dividends, the number that we actually get here with regards to this number is going to be 400 plus the dividends. We basically did that as a counting tool. So if we take the trailing 12 months, we subtract the 400, that's just going to leave us with the trailing 12 months of dividends. Then we simply divided that by the lowest all, the lowest all dividend yield, okay? And that gives us, when we, when we do the math here, when we take the trailing 12 months, we divide it by the lowest yield. The result of that is the price at the lowest yield. That's, that's, that's just the simple math around that. So let me just, uh, just to make sure we got that, let me just write this formula down real quick. So to find the price, we take the trailing 12 months here of dividends and we divide it by the actual yield here, okay? 
All righty. Okay, so let's go ahead. I'm getting a, a little message here, folks, so we need to wrap things up, but I do want to show you that. All right, so let me do this. So th these are the two lines that show that. Straightforward, I think. I'm going to go ahead and click on cancel here. I'm going to go ahead and click on cancel here. I want to share this link for those of you that are here live so you can, in, in, you can apply this update. Those of you that are catching this as an archive session, um, the link will be in the description, as mentioned a little bit earlier. Well, let me just send it over to you here real quick. Let's see. I'm going to call this updated um, H-I-S-T Y, so you guys know what it is and send that over to you. Okay, now just a reminder, investor, do keep this in mind, that everything we do in ThingScript is not guaranteed with regards to accuracy or time. Now, we've already noted that, that the code itself, even though, even though it appears to be, and I, I may have missed something, even though it appears to be correct, it may not come out with the anticipated results. So anything we do in ThingScript, and things we send out, it's not guaranteed with regards to accuracy, not accuracy or time. It tends to be helpful, but it is not guaranteed, okay? All right, let's go ahead and wrap everything up here for today, all right? Let's see how we did with regards to our discussion today, okay? What do we wanna do? We wanted to we wanted to basically discuss stuff that has already been written, okay? We wanna do a couple of little updates in relationship to that. We wanted to share the script links related to that, okay? Hey, just, remind, just heads up, investors, you can follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at KenRoseCS. I post things on Twitter related to this area as well as other areas of investing. I also encourage you to follow Ben on Twitter. He posts a lot of great information over there on Twitter as well. Also, circle your calendars. I believe I have this right, Ben. If not, correct me. But I believe Ben, Ben's, Ben is, I believe Ben is a new instructor for our protective, our protective strategy sessions, and that's Wednesdays at 3 p.m. So again. That's the Mr. Ben Watson, Protective Strategies, Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. I believe that's correct, but if not, again, Ben, please do correct me. Hey, everybody, hope you have a, have a great afternoon and a fantastic weekend. Merry Christmas. I got my Christmas jacket on, okay? So <laughs> Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, however you choose to celebrate the holidays. I hope you have fantastic and enjoyable holidays and hope to see you back here again next time. So bye, everybody. We'll catch you later. Thank you.